Tarian troops stomped over charred human bodies, tossing them into the ruins of skyscrapers reduced to rubble, laughing as they enacted the final solution to the human problem. Lieutenant Mark Burns of the United Earth Defense Forces limped through the devastation, blood seeping from the cauterized stump of his right leg, ended by a Katarian plasma bolt. Exhausted, grimy, but driven by cold drive, he dug through wreckage until his hands bled, uncovering a buried communications array. Burns pried open the casing and ripped out fried components, slamming in scavenged parts. He had to reach UEDF command. The Tarian surprise attack came during peace negotiations, their ships strafing cities while smiling diplomats shook hands. Trusting the Tarians was Earth's fatal mistake. After an hour of frantic repairs, the array crackled to life, but instead of command, it sputtered out distress call after distress call from decimated UEDF units, pleading for reinforcements. Reinforcements that never came. The UEDF was in full retreat. The array spat out a message from Colonel Knox, the Katarian overseer assigned to monitor the doomed peace process. Rejoice, human filth. The infestation of your wretched species ends today. The cracked screen flickered, displaying a massive Katarian armada flooding into the solar system. Thousands of Ivisrator-class warships, each one built to burn worlds. Burns slammed the RA off, denning Knox the satisfaction of a repli. UEDF defences couldn't hold against a fleet that size. Humanity would be wiped out, forced into slavery, tortured for Katarian amusement, unless an old legend surfaced in Burns's mind. The legend of the lost fleets, Heroic human ships said to return in Earth's darkest hour. Most dismissed it as myth, but with annihilation staring mankind in the face, Burns wondered. Wondered and hoped, even as Katarian bombs blotted out the sun. Three years before the Katarian onslaught, the UEDF exploratory vessel Magellan ventured to the fringes of known space. Captain John Mercer, a veteran of dozens of first contact missions, sat in the command chair, his eyes fixed on the display. He had overseen historic moments before, but something about this mission felt different. The anticipation on the bridge was palpable as the crew worked their stations with practiced efficiency. Captain, long-range scans have detected an uncharted planet, the sensor officer reported. Preliminary data suggests evidence of an advanced civilization. Mercer leaned forward, his interest piqued. What kind of evidence? Sprawling cities, advanced infrastructure, and what appears to be a global network of terraforming installations. Terraforming? Interesting. Mercer stroked his chin. Prep a landing party. Let's go say hello. The Magellan entered orbit, and Mercer led the landing party down in a shuttlecraft. As they descended through the atmosphere, they marveled at the planet's vibrant colors lush green forests, crystal-clear blue oceans, and gleaming silver cities that seemed to blend seamlessly with the natural landscape. The shuttle touched down on a landing pad outside the largest city, and the humans disembarked to find a delegation of tall, slender aliens with iridescent scales waiting for them. The leader stepped forward, a warm smile on his angular face. Greetings, he said in perfect English. I am Ambassador Zahn of the Tarian Empire. Welcome to our humble world. Mercer extended his hand, which Zahn shook firmly. Captain John Mercer of the United Earth Defense Forces, it's an honor to make your acquaintance. As introductions were made, Mercer couldn't help but feel a sense of relief. After centuries of brutal conflicts, humanity had finally encountered a species that seemed genuinely peaceful. The Tarians welcomed them with open arms, eager to share their knowledge and culture. Over the next several days, Zahn treated the landing party to a grand tour of the planet. They visited sprawling cities where sleek towers coexisted with lush gardens and explored vast nature reserves teeming with exotic flora and fauna. Mercer was particularly impressed by the Tarians' terraforming technology, which had transformed their world from a barren rock into a paradise in just a few generations. Your world is incredible, Mercer said as they walked through a habitat dome filled with towering trees and colorful birds. I've never seen such a perfect balance between technology and nature. 
Zahn smiled. It took centuries of careful planning and hard work, but we've learned to live in harmony with our environment. We'd be happy to share our knowledge with you. As the tour continued, Mercer and Zahn developed a rapport, discussing everything from their respective histories to their hopes for the future. The human delegation and their Qatarian hosts exchanged cultural artifacts, scientific data, and promises of future collaboration. But not everyone was convinced by the Tarians' friendly overtures. Ensign Mark Burns, the youngest member of the landing party and a prodigy in xenobiology, pulled Mercer aside during a break in the tour. Captain, can I speak with you privately? Burns asked, his voice low. Mercer nodded and followed Burns into an empty conference room. What's on your mind, Ensign? Burns hesitated as if unsure how to proceed. Sir, something about the Tarians doesn't feel right. They're terraforming their cities, even the distribution of species on the planet. It's all too... perfect. Mercer raised an eyebrow. Too perfect, I'm not sure I follow. The habitat domes, for example. The ecosystems inside are too uniform, too consistent across different biomes, and the genetic diversity of the flora is suspiciously low for a naturally evolved system. Mercer chuckled and clapped Burns on the shoulder. You're overthinking it, son. The Qatarians have been working on this planet for generations. Of course it's going to be a little too perfect. That's the point of terraforming, isn't it? Burns frowned, not entirely convinced. I suppose, but... Listen, I appreciate your concern, but let's not let baseless paranoia ruin what could be the start of a beautiful friendship. The Qatarians have been nothing but gracious hosts. We have no reason to doubt their sincerity. Burns reluctantly nodded, and the two men rejoined the others. The mission concluded with a grand ceremony in the Tarian capital, where Mercer and Zahn signed a historic treaty, establishing formal diplomatic relations between Earth and the Tarian Empire. As the Magellan began its journey home, its crew buzzing with excitement about the new alliance, Mercer couldn't shake the feeling that this was the dawn of a new era, an era of peace and prosperity for all of humanity. Little did he know that the seeds of destruction had already been planted, and that the Qatarians' friendly faces concealed a far more sinister agenda. Burns crouched behind the rubble of a collapsed wall, his breath coming in short, ragged gasps. The acrid stench of burning metal and flesh assaulted his nostrils as he surveyed the devastation around him. The once bustling city lay in ruins, its towering skyscrapers reduced to twisted heaps of steel and concrete. He had to find other survivors, rally what remained of Earth's defences. But as he picked his way through the debris, dodging Qatarian patrols with their gleaming armour and deadly plasma rifles, his thoughts drifted back to the days after the Magellan's fateful mission. Earth had embraced the Tarians with open arms, hailing them as saviours and friends. Tarian ambassadors were given lavish accommodations in every major city, their every whim catered to by fawning human officials. In return, Earth's leaders were invited to speak before the Tarian assembly, their words broadcast across the galaxy. But Burns had never trusted the Qatarians, not since those first unsettling discoveries on their homeworld. He had pored over the genetic data from the samples they had brought back, his unease growing with each anomaly he uncovered. The Qatarian flora was too perfect, too uniform. It was as if every plant had been meticulously engineered, shaped by a technology far beyond anything Earth possessed. His suspicions only deepened when he heard whispers of Tarian officials requesting access to restricted Earth facilities, military bases, research labs, even the UEDF's command centre. Burns had taken his concerns to Admiral Singh, his mentor and friend. To his relief, Singh had listened. If what you're saying is true, Singh had said, his brow furrowed, then we have a serious problem on our hands. We can't afford to take any chances, not with the safety of Earth at stake. Together, they had assembled a covert task force, hand-picking the best and brightest from across the UEDF. For months they had worked in secret, monitoring Tarian communications, tracking their movements, piecing together the truth behind the aliens' friendly facade. 
What they uncovered was chilling. The Qatarians had been building a vast network of spies and saboteurs, worming their way into every level of Earth's government and military. They had infiltrated research facilities, stolen classified technologies, and even begun to manipulate public opinion through a sophisticated propaganda campaign. Burns and Singh had been on the verge of exposing the Qatarians' true intentions when disaster struck. Singh's transport, carrying the evidence they had so painstakingly gathered, had suffered a catastrophic malfunction and crashed into the ocean. There were no survivors. The memory of that day still haunted Burns, the pain as fresh as the wound on his leg. Singh had been more than just his commanding officer. He had been a father figure, a guiding light in the darkness. With his death, their investigation had crumbled, and Burns had been left alone to carry the burden of the truth. A sudden explosion ripped Burns from his reverie, the shockwave slamming him against the wall. A Tarian drone had struck a nearby office tower, sending a hail of glass and steel raining down on the street below. Burns shielded his face with his arm, wincing as shards of debris sliced into his skin. He had to keep moving, had to find a way to stop the Tarians before it was too late. Earth's fate hung in the balance, and he was the only one who knew the true extent of the danger they faced. Gritting his teeth against the pain, Burns pushed himself to his feet and limped onward, his mind racing as he tried to formulate a plan. But deep down he knew the odds were stacked against him. The Tarians had planned their invasion for years, had infiltrated every aspect of human society. They had played the long game, and now they were poised to reap the rewards of their patience. As Burns stumbled through the ruined streets, the sound of Katarian laughter echoing in his ears, he couldn't shake the feeling that he was already too late. That earth, like so many worlds before it, was doomed to fall before the might of the Katarian war machine. Burns stumbled through the rubble-strewn streets, his injured leg throbbing with each step. The sound of Tarian patrols echoed in the distance, their harsh laughter sending chills down his spine. He had to find shelter a place to regroup and plan his next move. Their half-collapsed parking garage loomed ahead, its concrete walls pockmarked with plasma scorches. Burns limped inside, his eyes straining to adjust to the dim light. Suddenly, the unmistakable click of a rifle's safety catch being released froze him in his tracks. Don't move, a gruff voice commanded. Hands where I can see them. Burns complied, raising his hands slowly. I'm human, Lieutenant Mark Burns, UEDF. A figure emerged from the shadows, a battered rifle trained on Burns's chest. The man was older, his face weathered and scarred. His tattered UEDF uniform bore the insignia of a sergeant. Burns, huh? I'm Sergeant Hawkins, you alone? Burns nodded. As far as I know, my unit was wiped out in the initial attack. Hawkins lowered his weapon, motioning for Burns to follow. Come on, we've got a little hideout deeper in the garage. As they navigated the debris-strewn corridors, Hawkins spoke over his shoulder. I've got a few survivors with me. We've been laying low, trying to gather intel on the Cterians' movements. They entered a small, dimly lit room where a handful of soldiers huddled around a flickering lantern. They looked up warily as Burns entered their eyes haunted and hollow. Hawkins gestured to a crate. Take a load off, Lieutenant. You look like hell. Burns sank onto the crate, wincing as he stretched out his injured leg. I can't believe this is happening. The Tarians, we trusted them. Hawkins snorted. Trust. That's always been humanity's weakness. He leaned against the wall, his eyes distant. You know... This isn't the first time the Tarians have pulled something like this. Burns looked up, surprised. What do you mean? I fought in the last war with the Tarians decades ago. They pulled the same stunt back then. Came to us as friends, then stabbed us in the back. Hawkins spat on the ground. We managed to capture one of their high-ranking officers, a Colonel Zor. Interrogated him for days before he finally cracked. The other soldiers leaned in, their eyes wide. Hawkins continued, his voice low and intense. Zor spilled his guts about a secret Katarian protocol, something they called the Reaping. It was their playbook for conquering other worlds. Hawkins paced the room, 
his boots crunching on the debris-strewn floor. First, they'd come as allies, all smiles and open arms. They'd share their tech, their knowledge, making themselves indispensable. But all the while, they'd be working behind the scenes, undermining defences, stirring up trouble. He paused, his eyes locking with Burns. Sound familiar? Burns nodded grimly, the pieces falling into place. And once they'd weakened their target... They'd strike, Hawkins finished. Their fleets would come out of nowhere, overwhelming the poor bastards before they even knew what hit them. So what happened back then? How did we beat them? Hawkins chuckled darkly. We used Azor's intel against them, laid a trap, made them think we were on the ropes. When they committed their fleet, we hit them with everything we had, crippled their military, forced them to sue for peace. He shook his head, but we got soft, bought their lies about Zor being some rogue extremist, about how they truly wanted peace. We were so tired of war, we convinced ourselves they'd changed. Burns clenched his fists, anger welling up inside him. But they didn't change, did they? They were just biding their time, waiting for another chance. And we gave it to them, Hawkins said bitterly. Your little Magellan mission rolled out the red carpet for the Reaping 2.0. Burns buried his face in his hands, the weight of their failure crushing him. They had been played for fools, and now Earth was paying the price. Suddenly the sound of plasma fire erupted from the garage entrance. Hawkins cursed, grabbing his rifle. They've found us, defensive positions now. The soldiers scrambled, overturning crates and debris to form makeshift barricades. Burns snatched up a fallen plasma rifle, ignoring the pain in his leg as he took cover beside Hawkins. A squad of Tarian soldiers burst into the room, their sleek armor gleaming in the dim light. They opened fire, plasma bolts sizzling through the air. Hawkins returned fire, his shots finding their mark. Two Katarians went down, their armor smoking, but more poured in, their weapons spitting death. Burns! Hawkins shouted over the chaos. There's a maintenance tunnel in the back, leads to the sewers. Take the others and go. Burns shook his head. I'm not leaving you behind. Hawkins grabbed him by the collar, his eyes fierce. Listen to me, Lieutenant. You're the only one who knows the truth about the Katarians. You have to survive, have to find a way to stop them. He shoved Burns towards the tunnel. Now go, I'll buy you as much time as I can. Burns hesitated, torn. But the look in Hawkins' eyes brooked no argument. He nodded, gathering the other soldiers. As they fled into the tunnel, the sound of plasma fire intensified behind them. Burns risked a final glance back, just in time to see Hawkins disappear in a hail of searing blue bolts, a defiant roar on his lips. Tears stung Burns' eyes as he limped through the dank sewer tunnel, the weight of Hawkins' sacrifice heavy on his shoulders. The grizzled sergeant had given his life so that Burns could live, could carry on the fight. And fight he would. Even if he had to do it alone, even if it took his last breath, Burns vowed to find a way to stop the Katarians. For Hawkins. For Earth. For all the worlds that had fallen before and all those yet to come. Burns descended deeper into the bowels of the city, his footsteps echoing in the dank, dimly lit tunnels. The sewer network was a labyrinth of rusted pipes and crumbling brick, but Burns navigated it with a grim sense of purpose. He had to find the hidden UEDF bunker, had to contact Admiral Mercer before it was too late. So after what felt like hours of trudging through the muck, Burns finally reached his destination. A nondescript metal door, set into the wall of a long-abandoned maintenance room. Burns inputted a series of codes into the keypad, his fingers trembling with exhaustion and pain. The door hissed open, revealing a small Spartan chamber filled with outdated computer equipment. Burns limped to the central console, his eyes scanning the array of buttons and screens. There, in the center of the panel, was the quantum entanglement communicator. The device was a marvel of modern physics, capable of instant communication across the vast reaches of space. Burns had never used one before, but he knew it was his only hope of reaching Mercer. With a deep breath, Burns activated the communicator. The screen flickered to life, static crackling across its surface. Burns leaned in, his voice hoarse as he spoke. Admiral Mercer, this is Lieutenant Burns. Do you read me? 
For a moment there was only silence. Then a familiar face appeared on the screen. Mercer looked older than Burns remembered, his once youthful features lined with worry and guilt. Burns, my God, you're alive. What's happening down there? Burns wasted no time, his words tumbling out in a rush. The Katarians, sir, they've invaded. Earth is falling. I've uncovered the truth about their alliance. It was all a ruse, a ploy to weaken our defences. They call it the Reaping. Mercer's face paled, his eyes widening with horror. I, I should have listened to you all those years ago. I'm so sorry, Burns. Burns shook his head. There's no time for apologies, sir. We need to act and fast. What's the status of our fleet? Mercer's expression turned grim. Scattered, badly damaged, but there may be a way. Before the invasion, our scientists were working on a new weapon, codename Prometheus. It's an EMP device designed to disable an entire fleet at once, but it's untested, and it requires a massive power source. Where can we find one? The only suitable reactor is at a research station on Titan. If you can get to a spaceport rendezvous with one of our ships in orbit, you might be able to reach it. It's a long shot, but it's our only chance. Burns nodded, his heart made. Understood, sir, I'll find a way. Suddenly a series of tremors shook the bunker, dust raining down from the ceiling. Burns whirled, his eyes widening as an ominous hissing sound filled the air. What the hell was that? Mercer demanded, his voice tinged with panic. Burns didn't have time to respond. With a deafening screech of metal on metal, a massive drilling machine burst through the wall, disgorging a swarm of heavily armed Katarian soldiers. Their armor glinted in the dim light, their weapons trained on Burns. Burns dove for cover, snatching up a plasma rifle from a nearby rack. He knew he was outnumbered, outgunned, but he also knew that if he fell here, Earth fell with him. Burns? Burns, what's happening? Mercer's voice crackled over the communicator, but Burns had no time to respond. The Tarians opened fire, plasma bolts sizzling through the air. Burns returned fire, his shots finding their mark. Two soldiers went down, their armor smoking, but more poured in, their weapons spitting death. Burns fought with every ounce of skill and tenacity he possessed. He ducked and weaved, using the bunker's tight confines to his advantage. Plasma bolts scorched the walls around him, but he pressed on, driven by a newfound sense of purpose. Wave after wave of Tarians fell before him, but not without cost. Burns took several hits, his armor absorbing the worst of the damage, but he could feel his strength waning, his wounds taking their toll. Just as it seemed he would be overwhelmed, Burns saw an opening, a Katarian grenade fallen from the belt of a dead soldier. He snatched it up primed it, and lobbed it into the heart of the Katarian formation. The explosion rocked the bunker, sending shrapnel and bodies flying. Burns seized the moment, charging through the smoke and chaos. He emerged on the other side, battered but unbroken. The bunker was a ruin, the Tarians' bodies strewn among the rubble, but the communicator miraculously was still intact. Burns limped to the console, his breath coming in ragged gasps. Admiral, I'm heading to the surface. I'll find a way to tighten or die trying. Mercer's voice was thick with emotion. Godspeed, Burns. The fate of Earth is in your hands. Burns cut the connection, his gaze hardening with perseverance. He knew the odds were against him. He knew the journey ahead would be perilous, perhaps impossible. But he also knew he had no choice. Earth needed him. Humanity needed him, and he would not fail them, not while he still drew breath. With a final glance at the ruined bunker, Burns turned and limped towards the surface, ready to begin his last desperate mission. Burns clambered out of the sewer tunnel, the stench of death and destruction assaulting his nostrils. He blinked in the harsh light, his eyes adjusting to the scene of utter devastation that stretched before him. The once thriving metropolis lay in ruins, its skyscrapers reduced to jagged stumps, its streets choked with rubble and the burnt-out husks of vehicles. Thick black smoke billowed from countless fires, blotting out the sun and casting an eerie orange glow over the apocalyptic landscape. In the distance, the twisted wreckage of UEDF defense platforms littered the horizon. 
their mangled forms a testament to the ferocity of the Tarian assault. Burns felt a pang of despair as he surveyed the carnage, the magnitude of Earth's defeat hitting him like a physical blow. A faint sound caught his attention, a muffled whimpering coming from a nearby pile of debris. Burns limped over, his pulse quickening. There, huddled in the ruins of a collapsed storefront, was a group of civilians, men, women and children, their faces streaked with grime and tears, their eyes wide with fear and confusion. Burns approached them slowly, his hands raised in a gesture of peace. It's okay, he said softly. I'm Lieutenant Burns, UEDF. I'm here to help. A woman stepped forward, her dark hair matted with dust and blood. Thank God, she breathed. We thought we were the only ones left. Burns recognized her instantly. Dr. Eliza Novak, a brilliant engineer who had worked on the Prometheus project. He had seen her face in briefings, had read her papers on advanced propulsion systems. Dr. Novak, he said, extending his hand, it's an honor. Novak took his hand, her grip firm despite the tremors that ran through her body. Lieutenant, the Ktarians, they've taken the spaceport. We tried to get out, but they were too strong. They crushed any resistance. Burns felt a cold knot form in his stomach. The spaceport was their only hope of escape, their only chance to reach Titan and the Prometheus device. If the Katarians held it, then all was lost. He looked around at the frightened faces of the civilians, saw the desperation in their eyes. He couldn't let them down, couldn't let their last glimmer of hope be extinguished. An idea began to form in his mind, a daring plan that just might work. He turned to Novak, his voice low and urgent. Doctor, I need your help. We're going to send a message to the Katarians, one they can't ignore. Novak's brow furrowed. What kind of message? Burns smiled grimly. A challenge. We're going to call out Colonel Knox, the Katarian overseer. We're going to accuse him of cowardice, question his honor as a warrior. And then we're going to dare him to face me in single combat. Novak's eyes widened. Are you insane? He'll kill you. Maybe, Burns said, his voice steady. But it will draw him out along with a good chunk of his forces. And while they're focused on me, you and the others can raid the spaceport. Novak shook her head. It's suicide. It's our only chance, Burns said firmly. If we can get our hands on a ship, we can get to Titan, activate Prometheus. It's a long shot, but it's all we've got. Novak hesitated for a long moment, then nodded. Okay, she said softly. What do you need me to do? Burns grinned. I need you to help me rig a transmitter. We're going to hijack the broadcast frequency. Make sure every Tarian on the planet hears what I have to say. They set to work, scavenging components from the ruins, jury rigging a makeshift transmitter from scraps of wire and salvaged circuit boards. It was a far cry from the state-of-the-art equipment they were used to, but Novak's expertise and Burn's purpose made up for what they lacked in resources. Hours later, as the sun began to set over the ruined city, they were ready. Burns stood before the transmitter, his finger hovering over the activation switch. He took a deep breath, steeling himself for what was to come. To attention, Colonel Knox, he said, his voice ringing out over the airwaves. This is Lieutenant Mark Burns of the United Earth Defense Forces. I have a message for you and for all your Katarian brethren. He paused, letting the silence stretch out for a long moment. You think you've won. You think Earth is yours for the taking, but you're wrong. We will never surrender, never submit to your tyranny. His voice grew harder, sharper. Colonel Knox, I challenge you to single combat. You and me in the central plaza at dawn. Let's see if you have the courage to face me, or if you're nothing but a coward hiding behind your armies. He cut the transmission, his heart pounding in his chest. It was done, the die was cast. Now all they could do was wait, and hope that Knox's arrogance would be his undoing. Burns wrapped his hand around the chairs of his seat as the Katarian transport ship shuddered into the UEDF Indomitable's hangar bay. The massive flagship loomed before them, a gleaming behemoth jam, packed with weapons and armoured plating. As the ship settled onto the deck with a heavy clang, Burns unbuckled his harness and stood, 
wincing at the pain from his injuries. Dr. Novak and the other survivors followed suit, their faces a mix of exhaustion and unshakable focus. They had escaped Earth, but the fight was not nearly finished. The hangar doors hissed open, revealing a squad of UEDF Marines in full combat gear. At their head stood a figure Burns recognized instantly, Admiral Mercer, his once youthful face now etched with lines of worry and fatigue. Lieutenant Burns, Mercer said, clasping Burns's hand in a firm shake. Damn good to see you alive. Likewise, sir, Burns replied, but I wish it were under better circumstances. Mercer nodded grimly. We've got a lot to discuss. Follow me to the briefing room. As they walked through the Indomitable's corridors, Mercer brought Burns up to speed on the situation. The Qatarian fleet had established a blockade around Earth, their ships forming an impenetrable wall that prevented any UEDF reinforcements from breaking through. The scattered remnants of humanity's defences were outgunned and outnumbered, fighting a losing battle against the relentless Qatarian onslaught. Our only hope, Mercer said, is the Prometheus device on Titan. If we can get there and activate it, we might be able to turn the tide. Burns frowned. But the Qatarians will be expecting that. They'll have Titan locked down tighter than a drum. Exactly, Mercer agreed, which is why we're going to have to get creative. They entered the briefing room, where a holographic display of the solar system flickered to life. Mercer zoomed in on Titan, highlighting a cluster of red dots orbiting the moon. Intel suggests the Qatarians have dispatched a squadron of their most advanced warships to guard Titan, Mercer explained, led by none other than Admiral Zahn himself. Burns felt a chill run down his spine. Zahn was a legend among the Qatarians, a ruthless tactician who had never lost a battle. If he was personally overseeing the defense of Titan, their chances of success had just dropped drastically. So what's the plan? Burns asked, trying to keep the doubt from his voice. Mercer manipulated the display, bringing up a schematic of the Indomitable and a handful of smaller ships. We split our forces. The Indomitable and our escort ships will engage Zahn's squadron directly, drawing their fire and keeping them occupied. He pointed to a small, sleek vessel on the display. Meanwhile, you'll lead a strike team aboard this, the UEDF Spectre, our most advanced stealth frigate, while we distract the Ktarians, you'll slip past the blockade and make for Titan. Burns studied the plan, his mind racing. It was a huge risk. If the Indomitable couldn't hold Zahn's forces, his team would be cut off and stranded. But he also knew it was their only chance. You understood, sir, he said at last. We'll get it done. Mercer clapped him on the shoulder. I know you will, Burns. You're the best damn soldier I've ever served with. If anyone can pull this off, it's you. As Burns and his team boarded the Spectre, he felt a sense of calm settle over him. The odds were stacked against them, but he had a mission, a purpose. He would see it through, regardless of the cost. The Spectre's engines thrummed to life, the sleek vessel gliding out of the hangar and into the void. On the bridge, Burns watched as the Indomitable and its escorts peeled away, charging headlong towards the distant flashes of the Qatarian blockade. Godspeed, Admiral, he whispered, as the first lances of plasma fire lit up the darkness. Then, with a deep breath, he turned to his crew. All right, people, let's make this count. The spectre banked hard, its stealth systems engaging as it slipped into the shadow of a nearby moon. On the display, Burns watched as the UEDF fleet clashed with the Qatarians, the space between them erupting into a maelstrom of fire and debris. It was a titanic battle, the likes of which Burns had never seen. The Tarian warships were monstrous, their hulls dripping with advanced plasma cannons and shielded by shimmering energy barriers that shrugged off the UEDF's attacks like raindrops. The Indomitable shuddered under the onslaught, its armor plates buckling and melting under the relentless barrage. But Mercer held the line, his tactical brilliance shining through, as he maneuvered his battered ships with surgical precision. Burns watched in awe as the Admiral lured Zahn's flagship, a behemoth dreadnought, into a nearby asteroid field. The Qatarian ship, arrogant in its superiority, followed eagerly, its guns blazing. 
But Mercer had a trick up his sleeve. With a series of deft maneuvers, he used the rocky debris of the asteroids as cover, darting in and out of the floating mountains and peppering the dreadnought with precision strikes. Zahn's ship, for all its advanced technology, was too bulky and unwieldy to navigate the treacherous field. Its shields flared and flickered as asteroids pounded its hull, the impacts leaving gaping wounds in its armoured hide. And then, with a final daring assault, Mercer unleashed a devastating salvo from the Indomitable's main cannons. The concentrated fire ripped through the dreadnought's weakened shields and tore into its vital systems. Explosions rippled across its surface as it listed heavily trailing smoke and debris. With Zahn's flagship crippled, the Katarian line began to falter. Their coordination broke down, their formation crumbling as the UEDF pressed the advantage. But Burns had no time to savour the victory. The spectre was approaching Titan, and the sensor readings coming from the moon's surface were alarming. I'm detecting a massive energy surge from the research station, Dr. Novak reported, her voice tight with worry. The Katarians, they're trying to destroy the Prometheus device. Burns felt a cold knot form in his stomach. If the Katarians succeeded, if they destroyed the only weapon capable of stopping them. Full speed ahead, he ordered, his voice steely. We have to stop them at any expense. The spectre plunged towards Titan, its engines screaming as it raced against time. Burns knew they were flying into the jaws of the enemy, knew that the Katarians would be waiting for them. But he also knew that the fate of humanity, the fate of every free species in the galaxy, rested on their shoulders. They could not fail. They would not fail. As the research station loomed before them, a gleaming dome amidst the icy wastes of Titan, Burns steeled himself for the fight to come. The Ktarians had taken his world, had slaughtered his people. Now it was time for payback. Burns' heart pounded as the spectre touched down on Titan's icy surface, the research station looming before them like a frozen behemoth. The moment the hatch opened, plasma fire erupted from the swarm of Ktarian soldiers entrenched around the facility. Burns and his team dove for cover behind the spectre's landing gear, returning fire with steadfast perseverance. Push forward, Burns shouted over the din of battle. We have to get inside. Inch by bloody inch they advanced, leapfrogging from cover to cover as plasma bolts sizzled overhead. Burns took down a Tarian soldier with a well-placed shot, then another. His team moved in perfect unison, a well-oiled machine forged in the crucible of war. At last they reached the station's airlock. Burns slapped the control panel and the heavy doors ground open. They piled inside, sealing the entrance behind them. The interior was eerily quiet, the only sound the hum of machinery and the distant echo of Katarian boots on metal. Burns led the way, his rifle at the ready. They rounded a corner and found themselves face to face with a squad of Katarian elites. Plasma fire crisscrossed the corridor as both sides opened up. Burns dropped to one knee, squeezing off shots with pinpoint accuracy. Two Katarians fell, their armor smoking, but more took their place, pouring out from adjoining hallways. Fall back, Burns ordered, laying down covering fire. They retreated deeper into the facility, trading shots with the pursuing Tarians. Alarms began to blare, red lights flashing. They burst into the main reactor chamber and skidded to a halt, eyes widening at the sight before them. The massive reactor core pulsed with an angry red glow, arcs of energy crackling across its surface. Warning lights flashed on every console, and the air shimmered with heat. They've sabotaged the reactor, Dr. Novak gasped, rushing to a monitoring station. Her fingers flew over the keys, eyes scanning the cascading data. It's overloading. If it goes critical... How do we stop it? Burns demanded. Novak shook her head. The automatic fail-safes have been disabled. The only way is a manual shutdown of the core itself. She pointed to a heavily shielded door on the far side of the chamber. But whoever goes in there isn't coming back out. Burns set his jaw. Then I'll do it. No. Novak grabbed his arm. You don't have the technical knowledge. It has to be me. Burns started to protest 
but the look in her eyes stopped him. He saw the same steely commitment he felt in his own heart. The activation codes for Prometheus. Novak pressed a data drive into his hand. Finish what we started. Tears glistened in her eyes as she turned and sprinted for the reactor core. Burns watched her go, a lump in his throat. Then he whirled, barking orders to his team. Defensive positions. No one gets through that door. They took up positions around the control room, using overturned desks and equipment as makeshift barricades. The Qatarians burst in seconds later, and the chamber dissolved into a maelstrom of plasma fire. Burns ducked and weaved, his rifle bucking in his hands. He took down Qatarian after Qatarian, a man possessed. His team fought like demons at his side, holding the line against impossible odds. In the heart of the reactor core, Novak worked frantically, sweat pouring down her face as she manually disengaged the containment systems. Alarms screamed around her, the heat searing her lungs. With a final, desperate effort, she yanked the last lever. The reactor shuddered and went dark. The arcs of energy died away and the angry red glow faded. Novak slumped against the control panel, a smile on her face as the lethal radiation flooded the chamber. In the control room, Burns saw the reactor readings drop and knew Novak had succeeded. But there was no time to mourn. He leaped to the Prometheus control console and jammed in the data drive. Activation codes accepted, the computer intoned, initiating power-up sequence. But nothing happened. The screens remained dark, the device silent. The reactor shut down, one of his team members said grimly. There's no power. Burns pounded his fist against the console. They had come so far, sacrificed so much. It couldn't end like this. Desperate, he opened a comm channel to the Indomitable, praying that Mercer was still alive. To his relief, the Admiral's face appeared on the screen, battered but triumphant. Burns, the Katarian fleet is in disarray. Zahn's ship is destroyed. We've done it. Admiral, Prometheus is a no-go. The reactor is offline. We need power. Mercer's face fell. He was silent for a long moment, his eyes distant. When he spoke again, his voice was heavy with grit. We'll transfer the Indomitable's reactor power to Prometheus. Channel everything we've got. Burns' eyes widened. But, sir, that will leave the Indomitable defenseless. I know. Mercer's gaze bore into Burns. Do it, Lieutenant. That's an order. The screen went dark. For a heartbeat, nothing happened. Then, with a rising hum, Prometheus surged to life. Lights flickered on, consoles blinked awake. The device was ready. On the Tarian command ship, Colonel Knox stared at the sensor readings in disbelief. The energy buildup on Titan was off the scale. They had been outplayed. All ships, emergency jump, he barked. Get us out of here. But it was too late. Burns's hand came down on the activation button, and Prometheus unleashed its fury. A blinding pulse of energy erupted from Titan, a wall of electromagnetic destruction expanding outward at the speed of light. It washed over the Ktarian fleet like the hand of an angry god. Shields failed, engines died, weapons systems short-circuited. Proud warships became lifeless hulks, drifting impotently in the void. On the Indomitable's darkened bridge, Mercer watched the Ktarian fleet wink out on the tactical display. He closed his eyes a small smile on his face. They had won. Earth was safe, but the cost had been high, too high. Burns stood in the silent control room, numb with exhaustion and grief. They had achieved the impossible, but it felt like a hollow victory. So many lives lost, so much destruction. He thought of Novak, of Hawkins, of all the brave souls who had given everything for this moment. Their sacrifice would not be forgotten. Earth would rebuild, humanity would rise from the ashes, stronger and more united than ever before, and they would carry the memory of the fallen with them always, a shining beacon in the darkness. The Tarian threat had been ended, but Burns knew the fight was a long way to go. There would always be new enemies, new challenges to face, but as long as humans like those he had fought beside drew breath, there was hope. With a heavy heart and an unbreakable will, Burns turned to face the uncertain future. Burns staggered into the frigate's airlock. 
his breath coming in ragged gasps. Behind him, his team stumbled in, their faces ashen and haunted. The door hissed shut, sealing out the horrors of Titan's surface. In the cockpit, Burns slumped into the pilot's seat, his fingers flying over the controls. The frigate shuddered as it lifted off, escaping the moon's icy grip. But as they broke orbit, Burns' heart sank. The battlefield above Earth was a graveyard of shattered ships and broken dreams. The once mighty Ktarian fleet drifted lifelessly, their hulls scorched and pitted by the Prometheus's fury. But the UEDF had paid a terrible price for victory. The indomitable, Admiral Mercer's flagship was a twisted wreck, its proud lines shattered by the energy transfer that had sealed the Ktarian's fate. Burns bowed his head, tears stinging his eyes. Mercer had given everything to save Earth, a true hero until the end. As they navigated the debris field, a faint distress signal crackled over the comm. Burns exchanged a glance with his team, hope kindling in their eyes. He brought the frigate alongside the stricken UEDF cruiser, its hull buckled and venting atmosphere. They boarded the vessel, picking their way through darkened corridors and sparking consoles. On the bridge they found a lone figure slumped in the command chair, blood pooling beneath her. Captain Hawkins, Burns rushed to her side, cradling her head. Hold on, we're here. Sarah Hawkins, Sergeant Hawkins' daughter, opened her eyes, her face pale. Burns, the Tarians, he, they fled. What, where? Knock his flagship slipped away in the chaos, heading for a secret base, outer system. Burns' eyes sharp. As long as Knox lived, the Tarian threat endured. But with the UEDF fleet in ruins and Earth reeling, they had no hope of pursuit. Hawkins gripped his arm, her eyes fevered. The progenitors find their legacy, our only chance. The progenitors? Burns frowned. He had heard tales of the long-lost alien race, whispers of advanced technology hidden among the stars. How? Artifacts scattered across the galaxy. Find them, unlock their secrets. Hawkins pressed a data chip into his hand, her breath rattling. You must lead us now. With a final sigh, she slipped away. Burns closed her eyes, grief and rage warring in his heart. First Mercer, then Novak, now Hawkins. So many lives lost, so many sacrifices. He stood, the weight of command settling on his shoulders. Earth needed a leader, a champion. He would be that champion. Plot a course for the nearest UEDF outpost, he ordered, his voice raw but resolute. We have a new mission. As the frigate leaped into the void, Burns stared out at the stars, his mind a whirl with ancient legends and desperate hopes. The progenitor's legacy was out there, waiting to be found. And he would find it, no matter the consequences. For Earth, for the fallen, for the future. The hunt had begun. The UEDF cruiser's engines roared to life, propelling the newly christened Phoenix out of Earth's orbit and into the starry expanse. In the captain's chair, Burns gripped the chairs, his gaze fixed on the console. The weight of command settled heavily on his shoulders, but he bore it with the same unyielding spirit that had carried him through the darkest days of the war. Course laid in for the first set of coordinates, sir, the navigator reported, his fingers dancing across the console. Estimated time of arrival, six hours. Burns nodded. Engage. The phoenix leaped forward, the stars blurring into streaks of light as the ship accelerated to faster-than-light speeds. In the mess hall, the crew gathered around a holographic display, studying the fragments of the cosmic map they had pieced together from the progenitor artifacts. Dr. Novak, her face still bearing the scars of her ordeal on Titan, pointed to a cluster of glowing dots. If our calculations are correct, this should be the location of the next artifact. But the area is known for intense gravitational anomalies. We'll need to be cautious. Burns traced his finger along the projected route, his brow furrowed in thought. We'll take it slow, scan for any signs of trouble, but we can't afford to lose momentum. Every day we spend searching is another day Knox has to regroup and strike back. As if on cue, the ship's alarms blared, the lights shifting to a pulsing red. 
Burns bolted from his seat, his heart pounding. Report. Kurtarian ambush, sir, the tactical officer shouted over the din. They must have been waiting for us. On the view screen, a fleet of Katarian warships dropped out of light speed, their hulls overflowing with weapons. At their center was a massive dreadnought, easily twice the size of the Phoenix. Evasive maneuvers, Burns barked, his mind racing. Get us out of their weapons range. The Phoenix banked hard, narrowly avoiding a salvo of plasma torpedoes. The ship shuddered as the Tarians gave chase, their cannons hammering at the Phoenix's shields. In engineering, Captain Hawkins worked furiously to keep the ship's systems online, her face streaked with sweat and grease. Diverting power to rear shields, she called over the intercom. But we can't take much more of this. Burns furrowed his eyebrows, his eyes darting over the tactical display. The Katarians had them outgunned and outmaneuvered. Fighting wasn't an option, but maybe. Helm, bring us about, he ordered. Plot a course directly for that gravitational anomaly. The navigator hesitated, his eyes wide. Sir, the gravitational stresses... Do it, Burns snapped. It's our only chance. The phoenix swung around, its engines screaming as it plunged towards the swirling vortex of the anomaly. On the viewscreen, the Tarian ships pursued, their weapons still firing. But as the phoenix neared the anomaly... The Katarian shots began to go wide, the gravitational distortions pulling them off course. The dreadnought, too massive to maneuver effectively, was caught in the anomaly's pull, its hull groaning under the strain. Burns watched, his breath held, as the phoenix skimmed the edge of the vortex, using its gravity to slingshot around and behind the Katarian fleet. The enemy ships, still struggling to break free, were sitting ducks. Fire at will, Burns commanded, a fierce grin spreading across his face. The phoenix's cannons roared, lancing through the Tarian shields and hulls like they were made of paper. One by one, the enemy ships blossomed into fireballs, their remains scattered by the anomaly's relentless pull. As the last Katarian vessel exploded into oblivion, a cheer went up from the phoenix's crew. They had done the impossible, snatching victory from the jaws of defeat. But Burns didn't join in the celebration. His eyes were locked on the drifting wreckage of the Katarian ships, a cold realization settling in his gut. The Katarians had known their route. They had been waiting for them, which could only mean one thing. There was a traitor among them. Burns rose from his chair, his face grim. They had won the battle, but the war was a long way to go, and now they faced a new enemy, one that could strike from within. As the phoenix set course for the next artifact, Burns knew that the greatest challenge still lay ahead. They were racing against time, against an enemy that grew stronger with each passing day. And now they were racing against themselves, against the knowledge that one of their own might be working to destroy everything they had fought so hard to protect. You have reached the end of the story. If you enjoyed this story and want to support us, please leave a like and subscribe to our channel, and for every comment that says 88, I will heart every single one of them. Thank you for your time.